afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, I want to thank folks for coming to the presentation on Saturday afternoon. I want to really thank the organizers for what has been a really engaging and interesting session and for inviting us to be here. And I also want to thank the YouTubers who might listen to us one day um, <laughs> if we end up online. And I would like to give this presentation on the behalf of my colleagues, um, one of whom is going to come really into play, who's an assistant professor of neurology at the University of Kentucky Medical School in the United States, as well as uh, my Hungarian and Romanian collaborators. And this presentation today is really hopefully going to get us thinking about a fairly common kind of bioarchaeological data. And that is the reality of antemortem cranial trauma that we see that oftentimes gets interpreted in the context of thinking about interpersonal violence, that maybe gets uh, discussed when we think about the conflicts that people engaged in, sometimes practices about weaponry, sometimes even sex-specific or gendered violent practices. And so this is something that is fairly common. However, an area that's probably in woefully understudied when it relates to antemortem cranial trauma in bioarchaeological context is that soft tissue interaction related to the reality of traumatic brain injuries. And what I want to do today is get us thinking about the way in which bioarchaeologists might be able to think about traumatic brain injuries when we look outside of our discipline. Because there's a lot there when we think about what psychologists, uh, neurologists, and people who deal with clinical context of traumatic brain injuries. And these are just two screenshots of some review papers that sort of drive home what I hope is the thesis of my argument, that traumatic brain injuries are a disease process and not a static event, and that they're ultimately longitudinal in their manifestation. So that even though when we see the dry bone lesion of a healed cranial injury, what we're really looking at is something longitudinal that has potentially um, effects from a short-term um, consequence to a prolonged consequence and sometimes even a permanent consequence. And that's something very important that I think bioarchaeologists can, can consider. We also realize, dig, digging into some bioarchaeological data, for example, Jesper Boltzen's group in Denmark have actually shown this when they've looked at medieval people um, who had cranial injuries and who did not have cranial injuries. And that they've seen, for instance, that individuals with depressed cranial fractures that are healed have earlier onset mortality. And this is something that is mirrored in the clinical literature, depending on the studies, and there's a lot of them, where your likelihood of earlier mortality is virtually guaranteed if you experience a, a traumatic brain injury at some point in your life, as well as a host of other kinds of complications. What's also interesting about this reality, about thinking about uh, traumatic brain injuries, are historic accounts. And I have uh, on the slide here pictures of two Americans who were both well known to have sustained traumatic brain injuries at different points in their life. On the left is the American abolitionist Harriet Tubman, who during her early years um, as an enslaved person was injured um, by her overseer, which led to a lifetime of narcoleptic episodes and headaches that are well recorded. Um, and even though she lived to um, old age, which is slightly uncommon for the period and for people with traumatic brain injuries, um, this was something that stayed with her for her entire life. On the right-hand side is the well-known case of Phineas Gage, who was the American railroad worker who suffered an accident where the spike that he's holding in his, re in his right hand actually was launched through his skull and was the first time that um, physicians realized that a, a brain injury might permanently alter a person's personality so that it was the first time people realized that maybe if you inner, injure your frontal lobe, this is what a consequence might be. If you injure a parietal lobe, this is what might be a consequence, so on and so forth. So with this background in mind, I want to take us through a, one example in the bioarchaeological literature that is really recent, from 2018, 
that sort of couples this question about interpreting brain injuries with, um, as, as they've been mapped onto cranial defects. And so this is a paper that looks at a, a case study from Neolithic Sweden with an individual man who had suffered um, a, a, an anti-mortem injury to his um, parietal bone. I don't want to use this pointer. I've been staring at it all day. Um, and the paper um, goes into what the consequences of injuring that part of the brain might have involved. And the paper very eloquently um, then describes through the lens of the bioarchaeology of care what might have been the manifestations of how a person might have sustained help or care in both the acute period right after the injury and over the long term. So with this background, we'll go into what has been the last seven years of my uh, field work, focusing on the historic and medieval region of Transylvania, which is really why I wanted the pointer. So we're looking at this region here, which of course for the majority of its history was part of the Kingdom of Hungary. Um, this border of Hungary, of course, existed for about a thousand years and didn't really change until um, the end of World War uh, I. And within this particular region of the Kingdom of Hungary, we imagine what we know now as the border of our, the modern borders of Hungary, which were changed after the war, where we're going to be next year for EAA in Budapest. But I also want to draw people's attention to a region in the far eastern reaches of the Carpathian Basin, where an ethnic group of Hungarians called the Sike have lived and live today, numbering somewhere between 550 to 600,000 people. And so this region is where uh, my work has been centered, um, that if you were to go there today, you're going to be right in the middle of Romania. And so uh, one of the co-authors of this presentation is an archaeologist based at a museum, depending what language you speak, in the city of Oderhoyusekwiesk, if you're a Romanian speaker, or the city of Sike Udvarhe, if you are a Hungarian speaker. And on this map, you can see these yellow dots, which is where Jolt and his team have conducted large numbers of salvage excavations, usually around um, medieval era churches in one village or another, related to um, different kinds of uh, mitigating flood events, erosional events, or in some instances, historic preservation, as is the case in the Romanian village of Mujeni, or if we call it uh, by its um, <coughs> Hungarian name, the village of Bogos. And so in this community of Bogos is a beautiful, if you ever have the opportunity to go into Transylvania, I recommend stopping by this beautiful church that had probably its origin in the 12th century that for several years was the subject of a really wide scale renovation. And in the churchyard, um, there was a drainage ditch that was installed. You can sort of see um, where that is, and you can see on the map where uh, the trench is on the outsides of the church. Within that trench, 191 burials were recovered and were part of what myself and my field school students analyzed over a two-year period a couple of years ago. In this context is the subject of today's case study, who was grave 195, who rep is, is a middle adult now, whose radiocarbon date puts him somewhere between 1450 to 1640. So a late medieval or perhaps early modern, or depending how we define the medieval period in Transylvania, we might still be able to fudge it and say he's um, a late medieval man. His skeleton is not complete. The preservation is fair to moderate. But what was preserved um, is a really remarkable healed defect on his left parietal bone which you can see in the image uh, that has well-heeled uh, margins. Uh, it also rep is represented by having a radiating fracture and um, is luckily intact. If the technology works, I'm going to show you. I've got a three-dimensional scan um, that we'll, we'll take a look just to see what this cranium looks like. In the posterior region, you're going to see some um, taphonomic alterations in the form of coffinware. Uh, but as the skull rotates around, you're going to be able to see the margins of that defect as well as the radiating fracture in a bit more detail. Um, I haven't included any endocranial shots, but what's interesting is we can see some of the healing right around the margins of the defect. Um, 
But what we don't see is the radiating fracture puncturing the endocranial table. Um, regardless, it's interesting to think about the anatomical location of this above what in forensic anthropology we call the hat brim line. It's interesting that it's on the left-hand side. I could probably, in another talk, um, discuss what I think happened as the etiology of this injury, but suffice it to say, this man suffered a significant penetrating defect to the cranium, which is where my colleague, who is um, a, a neuropsychologist, comes into play. Uh, and when I talked to him about this case, um, he said, how come um, bioarchaeologists aren't really investigating these kinds of questions. And I was like, Tim, because we don't know neurologists like you. He said, well, <laughs> let me help. And he said, first of all, if you injure your skull in this region, you will have injured your left parietal lobe. And he said, there's a manifestations of things that can occur that, again, could be a short-term um, impairment, could be prolonged, could be permanent. One of those are impairing to some degree, your tasks of working memory. So that might be, for example, today, if someone tells you their phone number and you write it down, if you have a, this region of your parietal lobe damaged, you might not be able to recall what it is. Or you might be able to say, um, let's go to restaurant X after the meeting or this pub, not being able to retain that information that you were given immediately. And again, that could be a permanent fixture of this person's uh, memory. If you're injured on your left parietal lobe because of the way in which sort of the, the brain functions, the sense, sight, taste functions on the right side of the face might have been impaired. So that might have meant if there was something hot or cold, he would not have known, he would not have been able to sense that, um, and could have had some kind of degree of paralysis of this side of the sensory um, portions of the face. There could have also been a serious inability to comprehend speech. So people in his household, in his community, might have been having conversations to which um, he no longer knew the meaning of simple words, whether those were things related to foodstuffs, bodily hygiene, um, family members, um, whatever people were saying, he might not have had the same ability to understand what he was told um, in, at, prior to this injury. And then lastly, is that there could have been some disruption of visual tasks. Um, and we know that, of course, the occipital lobes are where our, uh, our, our vision senses are, but in that parietal lobe are where the important fibers are that transmit some of those, um, some of those signals. And so it's known in the clinical literature that sometimes people with um, a parietal lobe injury had some cortical blindness as a result of that, um, of that defect. So to bring this back to this individual, uh, I think it's quite useful as we move forward for this, as we think about this in other instances, to not exclude a traumatic brain injury from his osteobiography. Right? When we think about also through the very eloquent extension of the bioarchaeology of care, for instance, there is virtually no way after sustaining an injury like that that you would not have been um, made unconscious right, for some amount of time. And so what kind of care does a person need who is, um, who is made to be unconscious for how long? As your cranium is healing up that has a, 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 an open wound, what kind of care is required in that instance? And then lastly, over the period of time that the injury healed, right, what are the manifestations of how, if there was some kind of prolonged or permanent damage, how might have people in his household um, worked with him? How might have they um, worked with him at his frustrations for not being able to recall words that he knew or words that he might have thought that he might have, should have known? So on and so forth. So I think that this is going to be a case study as my colleagues and I continue to think through it, that the clinical literature that is really clear on the experiences of people with parietal lobe injuries, um, as well as any other kind of study where you might see a cranial injury, I think that those are going to be really important um, data sets to draw from as, as we continue to think about, re-examine, and maybe improve upon how we have dealt um, with our interpretation of anti-mortem cranial injuries. So I want to thank you for your attention. and. Um, Take any questions if there's any time, or maybe there's not.
Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you.